morning again, First Unitarian. Perhaps you saw the uh, first announced email blast that came out last Thursday and the description of this particular Sunday service. Well, um, that was a little awkward, um, at least for me. That description that you read was uh, cut and pasted from some shorthand side notes on a planning spreadsheet that were never intended to be published. And uh, what was published was not adequately proofread. I apologize for any confusion about that. Uh, another thing I wanna let you know about is that in an effort to help our community stay connected in these times of social distancing, we're gonna launch a program of small groups to meet online. Uh, in the fall under the general category of core circles, but they'll be time limited and it will be available to everyone. Uh, if you'd like to participate or you'd like more information, uh, please email me or Beverly Bravo at bravodenver at gmail.com. There will be uh, more information in the first announce that comes out this coming Thursday. And one last announcement, uh, please be on the lookout for an email from Mary Sullivan about our upcoming congregational meeting that'll happen on May 31st. Uh, obviously, this one's going to be quite a bit different than anything we've ever tried before in terms of a congregational meeting, uh, but you will be getting detailed reports and documents and other information about the agenda. Please read those carefully. If you can, please ask questions in advance. And most importantly, if you're a member of First Unitarian Denver, please sign in and take part in that meeting. Now, um, this morning, I'd like to reflect with you about something that I believe is on pretty much all of our minds, uh, something we've been wrestling with or, or even just feeling, even if we haven't put words to it. That is, what are we to make of this COVID world that we are currently living in? What kind of world is going to emerge from this COVID world that we're in right now, if indeed this one ever passes? And, um, and maybe most importantly, where, where can we look for something to hang on to in this time that is not just more misinformation or polarization or senseless noise? I want to be very clear about what, I'll what I'm talking about. And um, among the many terrifying statistics, I'm going to mention just one. More than 36 million people have applied for unemployment insurance in the last two months. 36 million people. And just like the chances of getting sick, the poor and the working poor are the people who are at the highest risk. Almost 40% of workers uh, in households that make less than $40,000 a year are out of work or have lost work. Very soon, the hold that has been put on evictions in many jurisdictions, including Denver, is going to expire. And if the predictions that I have seen are true, the population of people and families who are homeless is going to double or more in the next year. This will be especially true in relatively prosperous cities like Denver, uh, New York, etc., where uh, rents and real estate were already and increasingly unaffordable. In the midst of this, and that's just one statistic, in the midst of this, and I'm gonna be just really blunt here, we have an administration in Washington that continues to be dishonest about the facts of the pandemic and other crucial issues, is literally purging the jobs of those who would tell the truth, and has been relentlessly opportunistic in fanning the flames of division and discontent in an already tense and fragile society, that's where we are. There's a bright side, or at least I think, I believe there is an emerging bright side. Also in the midst of all this, if we've been paying attention, we've been learning a great deal. And it appears that a growing number of people are learning a great deal and becoming aware of some of the things I'm going to talk about right now. We have learned who's really essential in a crisis like this, right? The people who pick, process, transport, and distribute food, pretty essential. 
the people who pick up the garbage and the people who keep the water and the electricity running and the people who keep the machines running and the people who care for our children and the elderly. Pretty essential. These are the foundations of being able to live in a hygienic and civilized world. You know, um, nothing against some of these folks, but you know, stockbrokers, head fund managers, businesses that are designed, whose whole model is to take more from the economy than they put back, not so essential right now. We have learned that doctors and nurses and nurses aides and healthcare workers are where the rubber meets the road when it comes to taking care of people. And you know, in those circumstances, politicians and insurance companies, yeah, not so essential. We have learned that it's good to be able to see the mountains on a clear day like you can today and breathe fresh air without the brown haze that usually hangs over the city. And we seem to be learning some bigger lessons too. Lessons that I believe cut through the politics and all the noise that's ringing in our ears right now. We seem to be learning that when you have a disease that spreads through human contact, it's almost impossible to keep the world's poor, the world's refugees, and the world's workers invisible. Because we're all in contact. Right? Whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, it's a small, interconnected world, and we're all in this together, no matter what they tell you. Given that, I think, I hope, we're beginning to understand that universal health care actually keeps everyone healthy, reduces the risk for everyone. I hope, I think, we're beginning to understand that massive inequality only makes the veneer of civilization weaker and more fragile. I'm gonna repeat that, because that's really important to understand. Massive economic inequality makes every single institution that maintains a civilized society weaker and more fragile. If we open our eyes, we will see the evidence for this everywhere. I think, I hope, more people are beginning to see that global problems like pandemics and refugees and climate change require global solutions. And so international cooperation instead of America first is the only rational, sane approach. The only one. I could go on and on, I'll list one more thing. Lastly, for now, think, I hope, we are beginning to understand that the myth of individualism is basically a propaganda tool for consumerism. And I know there are some notable and very loud exceptions to these realizations among the very wealthy and the politicians that work for them. But it's also true that a lot of people I know and talk to are beginning to hope that one of the outcomes of the current mudslide, the current great fall off the wall, will be rethinking mindless capitalism as a kind of religion, rethinking consumerism in the form of endless distraction, the illusion of an, a world of endless abundance and the absurd merry-go-round of acquisition. Let's hope that that particular greatest show on earth is beginning to fade into history. And, and if we can make it so, let us not mourn its passing. Our whole soul living theme for this month is change. And makes this a fine time to remember that change is inevitable. In the words of the poet, uh, William Stafford, nothing you can do will change times unfolding. Change is inevitable. Progress and sanity moving forward from here are not. That's optional. And we should be realistic. Making peace or making progress against the forces that are killing us will be much harder and take much longer 
than making peace or progress against COVID-19. COVID-19 is just the most recent crisis to lift the veil, as it were, and give lie to the illusion of equality and stability and show us in stark relief just how cruel and ruthless we have created this world and its human economic environmental system to be. For God's sake, let's say enough already. The truth is that we know what works on almost every score. We know how to contain the spread of a virus. The science is right there. We know how to end homelessness. We know how to feed the hungry. We know how to reduce our production of carbon and other pollutants. We know how to accomplish all manner of things that are clearly good for humanity and the planet that sustains us. The only question is whether we will have the will to go with the knowledge that we have. I'm suggesting today, I'm going to suggest that we avoid most of the arguments, the red herrings, the divisiveness, the race baiting, and other distractions of modern politics. I'm going to suggest this is a really good time to stick to the basics, like the really fundamental basics. Jesus gives us a fine example. Matthew chapter 25, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I would needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And Jesus replies, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these who is one of, one of the least of these who are my brothers and sisters, so you did it for me. There's no moral ambiguity here. None. There's no doubt about what's being communicated. There's no obfuscation. There's no red herrings. There's no distraction. There's no lies. That is the kind of clarity we need right now. Amen. As the music plays, you are invited to type in your own reflections, sharing with your community. What do you hope COVID-19 is teaching us that we can carry forward into the future? And what is it teaching you? Amen, friends. I hope to see you soon.